Good morning everybody and welcome to today's service and happy Mother's Day and I mention that because well it is but also because um, it's our daughter's very first Mother's Day and we're so great, grateful for the safe arrival of Phoebe Joy Pattle. She arrived in the world on 9th of March 9.33 in the morning, weighed five pounds 12 ounces and mum and baby are doing well, and so are the grandparents. Thank you. Hi, Bridget. It's lovely to see you. How are you? Oh, I'm very well, Alison. Thank you. Lovely to see you. And we've missed you, obviously. Um, I'm asking everybody, is there anything you're particularly encouraged by? Well, I'm very encouraged by the church and all the support they give us, even though we don't meet up. I'm just thankful to God for the church, especially for Baptist Church, mm. Cross Street Baptist Church. Mm. And is there anything you'd particularly like us to pray for? Uh, yes, please. I'd I'd like to pray uh, for for me because I'm getting a bit lethargic, mm. and, and I, I it's not me to mm. be like no. that because I I'm very gap and go, and I, I need. To get through that. Lots of people are feeling the same at the moment, aren't they? But of course, we will pray. Thanks, Bridget. Lovely to see you. God bless. Good morning. Welcome to Pod Street Baptist Church Online. I should just say to all mothers out there, Happy Mother's yeah. Day to all those celebrating today and for all those that this is a difficult day. We are thinking of you and praying for you. Another songs of praise. If you still haven't been on, you probably will be next week or soon anyway. And there's always room for one or two more if you have a particular choice. For those of you who might like to come, we'll be having a communion service on Monday, Thursday at 7 p.m. in church. If you want to book a place, please let me know. I also have spaces available at 2 p.m. on Easter day for a further Easter day communion. I have plenty of space at two o'clock. The 9.31 is full. We have gathered to worship the living God, to journey together and share together as the family of God. Let's take a moment to empty ourselves of all those things that might prevent us from allowing God to meet with us today. He still meets us in these strange times. He is still close. A moment of silence. living, loving God. We praise to you that you are above all else a God of love, not of judgment, anger or vengeance, but constant and total love. You gave your all for us. And though our relationship with you is so often one-sided, our commitment is such a contrast to your faithfulness. Our response so feeble beside your grace. Still, you go on blessing us. Your generosity is inexhaustible. Father, fill us up with more of your love, that it might flow out to those around us, that it will reach upward in worship, inward in fellowship, and outward in service. Hold us in this space to the glory of your name. Amen. Over to you, Helen. Hello, my name's Helen Gardner. Um, I've chosen the song Bless the Lord, O My Soul um, for several reasons, really. Um, the first reason I've chosen it is because it gives me great memories and lots of good times that we've had in the choir at church. Um, this was one of the first songs that I remember singing in the choir um, and just my love of singing and just being able to be with everybody else in that environment in church um, brings back really good memories. Um, another reason I've chosen this song is because it was one of the first songs that Isabel um, actually started singing properly. She loves this song and it's lovely to hear her singing as well. Um, she can sing along with the rest of us. 
Um, and I think a really important reason is that even as in the world as it is at the moment, I can still find many, um, maybe not 10,000, but many reasons to be thankful for everything I still have and I've got and I've been given um, by being faithful to God and having him in my life and my family's life. And I just hope you enjoy the song as much as I do.
Hi, hi Jess. It's lovely to see you. How are you? I'm not too bad. Up and down, but yeah, I'm fine. Like everyone else, aren't they? Like everyone else. Yeah. It's yeah. a bit of a struggle at the minute, isn't it? Yeah, be glad when we're all back together. Well, again. yes. Um, you've picked a song for Songs of Praise. What is it? And why have you chosen it? It's how great thou art and isn't he just. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I just I've had it at all the important things in my life and I have it in my car. I'm singing it all day long, especially when I'm down. Um I just love it. Yeah. It brings out the And we, and we <laughs> sing the... it so well at Potter Street, don't yeah. we? It's a shame we can't sing it in church, but that day will yeah, come soon. I just look forward to that. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Thanks, Liz. Hi Ron, it's lovely to hear from you. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Yes, keeping quite keeping active. But staying indoors today because it's a bit wind, wet and windy. It is indeed, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Ron, you've picked a song for Songs of Praise. Could, yes. you, could you tell me what it is and why you've chosen it? Now, I chose How Great Thou Art. Um, I mean, it's what I call a, a good old tub thumper is the expression I use. Um, but it says so much and um, I heard it at a when I became a Christian at the Billy Graham Crusade back in 1966, when I was 13. And um, it just, it's, it's the, the how great thou art, the fact that although God is so great, he still loves us as his children, you know, and, um, you know, we've been adopted into his family, you know, and, and we can call him father. And um, although he is such a great God, you know, we can have that close relationship with him. And that's that's what it means to me, that it's, it's not a case of, you know, how great thou art and I'll never get anywhere near you. It's how great thou art and how, how great and awesome that you care about little old me, you know. Fantastic, Ron. Thanks ever so much. That's OK.
I waited patiently for the Lord to help me, and he turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on solid ground and steadied me as I walked along. He has given me a new song to sing, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see what he has done and be amazed. They will put their trust in the Lord. Oh, the joys of those who trust the Lord, who have no confidence in the proud or in those who worship idols. O oh Lord, my God, you have performed many wonders for us. Your plans for us are too numerous to list. You have no equal. If I tried to recite all your wonderful deeds, I would never come to the end of them. You take no delight in sacrifices or offerings. Now that you have made me listen, I finally understand. You don't require burnt offerings or sin offerings. Then I said, look, I have come. As is written about me in the scriptures, I take joy in doing your will, my God, for your instructions are written on my heart. I have told all your people about your justice. I have not been afraid to speak out, as you, O Lord, well know. I have not kept the good news of your justice hidden in my heart. I have talked about your faithfulness and saving power. I have told everyone in the great assembly of your unfailing love and faithfulness. Lord, don't hold back your tender mercies from me. Let your unfailing love and faithfulness always protect me. For troubles surround me, too many to count. My sins pile up so high, I can't see my way out. They outnumber the hairs on my head. I have lost all courage. Please, Lord, rescue me. Come quickly, Lord, and help me. May those who try to destroy me be humiliated and put to shame. May those who take delight in my trouble be turned back in disgrace. Let them be horrified by their shame. For they said, Aha, we've got him now. But may all who search for you be filled with joy and gladness in you. May those who love your salvation repeatedly shout, The Lord is great! As for me, since I am poor and needy, let the Lord keep me in his thoughts. You are my helper and my saviour. O oh my God, do not delay. This is a, ver a favourite verse of mine. One night I dreamed I was walking along the beach with you, Lord. Many scenes from my life flashed across the sky. In each scene, I noticed footprints in the sand. Sometimes there were two sets of footprints. Other times there was only one. This bothered me because I noticed that during the, the low periods of my life, when I was suffering from anguish, sorrow or defeat, I could see only one set of footprints. I said to, to the Lord, you promised me, Lord, that if I followed you, you would walk with me always. But I have noticed that during the most tiring periods of my life, there has only ever been one set of footprints. Why, when I needed you most, you were not there for me? The Lord replied, The years when you have seen only one set of footprints, my child, is when I carried you. Hello, Betty. Lovely to see you. Now, we've just been to the hospital, haven't we, for an appointment, and you told yes. me a story. I wonder if you'd tell everybody that same story. Yes, I will. Uh, now, the thing is, I wear a hearing aid, I, well, two, and I decided that needed to change one. So I got the hearing aid, took the battery out, and went and put another one in. The card was empty, so I walked around from my chair to the desk, got the new card, came back. I was looking for the hearing aid. I couldn't find it. I was looking, uh, moved the chair, I opened it up as a recliner. No, no hearing aid. Um, they looked, moved the next chair, nothing there. So I thought, well, 
I said a prayer to myself and I thought, it's no good, got to do something. Anyway, I sat down again and I looked all round and I thought, well, you'll have to manage with only one, which is going to be very difficult. And then suddenly I looked in my lap and I forgot to tell you, I was only wearing a nighty, so it didn't catch in anything. But there in my lap was my hearing aid, which I previously could not find. And I think that is my little miracle. And I bless the Lord, thanked him for everything he does for me. Thanks, Betty. That's a lovely story. So hi Sarah, it's lovely to see you. First of all, how are you? Because people are praying. I'm getting there, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm back at work, but only for three mornings a week at the moment. And it's going to be reviewed. And I'm also now going being referred to a long COVID clinic to try and help get my chest to where it should be so I can get back to my lovely exercising that I'm really in, in missing, to be fair. Yeah. But it's good to be at least back at work for some in some capacity. Yeah. Because uh, I was starting to get a little bit... <laughs> Mm, <laughs> at yeah, home. I can understand that. Um, yeah, so I'm getting some sort of exercise as such. I'm not just sat around doing nothing. So it's helping, I think, being yeah. back. Right. But I think it's still going to be a, a long road before I'm back full time. But yeah. hopefully before the summer holidays. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be yes. back once. Yeah, yeah. But it's, it's not that far away. It's, it's only not actually, is it? Yeah. yeah, but hopefully, yeah, I'll be back to normal before then. And you picked a song for Songs of Praise. Mm -hmm. So I just wonder what it was and why you've chosen it. It's Jesus Be the Centre and uh, people that have known me a long while might know that I always choose this one. <laughs> um, nearly 18 years ago now I started coming to Potter Street and it was one of the first songs that I heard when I first came along and it, the first song that really resonated with me. It's lovely and simple, it says exactly what you want it to say and it's been every ceremony I've ever had since. My baptism, my wedding, sorry our wedding, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, the boys um, dedications and yeah it's just and it's not one that we sing all that often these days because we've got some lovely new ones coming through yeah. but i really do like it it just yeah. it just it pops into my head every now and again just as i'm pottering around the kitchen and it's just one that's always sat, stayed with me and i love it brilliant thanks very much thank you Jesus. 
Hi, Pat. It's lovely to see you. How are you? Hi, Alison. Yeah, I'm good, thanks. Yeah, not too bad. And you've chosen a song for Songs of Praise. I just wondered yeah. if you could tell us what it is and why you've chosen it. Okay, well, I've chosen um, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, and I've picked it actually simply because over the past month, it's a song I found myself singing at the most random of times, waking up, not, not, not out loud, by the way, that wouldn't be good, but in my head, um, in the car on the way to work, you know, waking up in the middle of the night worried about stuff. It's just one that's come into my head. Um, and the words, I think, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of the earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. They just kind of put things into perspective a bit, and um, they help us remember what, and more importantly, who is important um, in life, and that Jesus is bigger than anything life might throw at us. And I think especially it's poignant at this time because it's kind of quite easy to get fearful and a bit overwhelmed by all the craziness in the world and um, there's a peace in knowing that um, in the light of Jesus's glory and grace uh, the things of the earth will grow strangely dim and I think that's the line that really sticks out for me so yeah, yeah that's why I've chosen that song <laughs> thank you very much indeed Hello everyone. My moment this week is a brief thought about one of the Bible readings I had earlier and it's Ecclesiastes 5 verse 2. Do not be quick with your mouth, do not be hasty with your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth so let your words be few. This said two things to me. One, whatever we say or whatever we do, God knows. But the other was also th something my late mother would say, and that's, if you've got nothing nice to say, say nothing. This was on my computer about 8.15 in the morning before many people came on site at college. And I took that to mean that I might need to be patient today. And sure enough, by nine o'clock, I had been asked to deliver COVID test training to a group of staff teachers and managers and sure enough as I can say that teachers and their managers make the worst pupils it was like trying to herd frogs I needed to be truly patient and to bite my tongue on several occasions this gave me some reassurance that God is with me even in the mundane everyday things then not much later I had to deal with a very difficult and very sad situation and initially I thought oh, I'm out of my depth but I know God was preparing me um, not just for my rowdy staff session but also for this 
difficult time too. Totally amazing. He knows way before we do and he gives us what we need, even before we know we need it. Have a good week, everybody. When are you going to Sheringham? I asked Irene, my allotment neighbour. She has a caravan near Sheringham, a lovely town on the Norfolk coast. Then Boris lets me, she said. Sheila and I enjoy going to Sheringham. And Irene said, it doesn't change much, does it? I agreed. And she went on to say, even the railings are still there. I was puzzled at this, but she went on to say, my daughter got her head stuck in these railings. She was seven years old at the time. She must be in her mid-thirties now. Then Irene went on, we just could not get her out and were thinking of contacting the fire brigade. But her husband said, well, her head went through, so we must be able to get it back through the railings again. And he carefully lifted his daughter's head and she was freed. I said, that story reminds me of the episode in Dad's Army, when Private Pike got his head stuck in railings. And Irene said, oh yes, and laughed. Irene's story made me think of another incident. I'd just started teaching in Stewart School and was living in a flat in Moorfield near Staple Tye. My parents came down from Lincolnshire to visit me one Saturday. In the afternoon we decided to go for a walk. But had only gone a few yards when we came across a young boy who had his legs stuck between a lamppost and a wall. He'd probably been standing on the wall and decided to use the lamppost as a fireman's pole and slid down it, but as it was so close to the wall, he got his legs stuck. We could not free him. We were coming to the conclusion that we'd have to contact the fire brigade when a young girl, in fact one of my pupils, came up and said, Mr Carroll, we've seen what's happening and have contacted the fire brigade. And off she went. So my parents and I waited until the fire engine arrived and several firemen got out. One of them put a jack between the wall and the lamppost and it levered the lamppost away from the wall, freeing the young boy. It's not only children who get stuck at times, is it? In the same chapter as the parable of the prodigal son, Jesus tells another parable of a man who had a hundred sheep and loses one of them. He leaves the ninety-nine and looks for the lost sheep, finds it and carries it home. It said that when a sheep becomes separated from the flock, it may refuse to move and has to be carried back. Just as that father gently eased his daughter's head through those railings, and like the fireman lifting the boy out between the lamppost and the wall, so God is there to scoop us up into his arms when we are stuck, perhaps transfixed with terror or worry, unable to move and carry us home. Hi Sue, lovely to see you. And you. You've picked a song for Songs of Praise. Can you tell me what it is and why? My, one of my favourite uh, songs, hymns, is Be Thou My Vision. Um, it's quite an old hymn. I think it was an Irish, um, an Irish song from, from many centuries ago. Um, it's a hymn that I've always remembered. I, I think that I sang it when I was in the Girls' Brigade many years ago. And I have a lot of favourite hymns and songs, modern ones, old ones, but I think this one has always stuck in my mind because I've been singing it for so long. And just to say the last sort of verse, High King of Heaven, my victory won, may I reach heaven's joys, O bright heaven's sun. Heart of my own heart, whatever befall, still be my, thou my vision, O ruler of all. Not be all else to me. 
Dear Heavenly Father, we turn our thoughts to you with our prayers and requests for the needs of our world, for our own needs, Father God, and for the needs of those close and dear to us. Above all, we come with confidence, faith and hope to your throne of grace, where you have called us to worship you in spirit and truth through the life and merits of Jesus. We pray that what we ask for will be in accordance with your will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our world, for those countries where there is disruption because of the viral pandemic and where, in addition, people are suffering because of economic, political or social issues. We think particularly of Myanmar at this time. Bring peace and reconciliation. We thank you for the visit of Pope Francis to Iraq. We pray that it will enable all peoples to live in harmony and peace there and take the pressure of suffering Christians in Iraq. Be with persecuted Christian people everywhere, we pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our town, Harlow, for all the churches and their leaders. May they be beacons of hope and love in our world. We pray for the hospitals in our area, coping with the virus, treating patients with the virus, and at the same time attempting to respond to the needs of other illnesses and conditions. Bless and strengthen all the staff serving there and keep their morale high, we pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all the other services that operate here in Harlow, fire and ambulance, the police service, council services, those who keep our food supplies available, and particularly bless those volunteers who help the needy and vulnerable in all their diverse ways at this particular time. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless and strengthen all those who work in education at this difficult time. Give them strength and resilience as they have taken all children back this week. Allow them space to rest and be refreshed and keep them clear of infection. Lord God, enable all children to stay resilient and not give way to anxiety and depression as they consider their future, especially those contemplating exams this year. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we lift before you people in our church family. We thank you for new birth to Rachel and John, Andy and Liz's um, daughter. Bless and favour her development. We rejoice and give thanks for prayers heard regarding health issues as we continue to pray for their recovery. Jeff Tarling, Claire Dipanar, Derek Watts, now that he can have a visitor. And then we continue to ask you to pour your healing grace into the minds and bodies of those who need your touch. Sis Jellyman, Jane Chiverell, Steve Hulkoop, Yvonne's husband Nemat and the family, Roland Hutchins and Jackie, Sandra Finley's nephew, weak from the virus, Lana's family, particularly her grandson and daughter, Jill Harley's family, Sue and Jeff's granddaughter, the family of Sarah Everard after her disappearance. Dear Lord, give them healing and recovery. Give them a sense of your presence to comfort them and your peace. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. Amen. Our Father, the Son of the Heaven, I will be your name. My kingdom come. My will be done on earth and it is in heaven. Give us a day our day bread. Forgive us our services as we give those who trust against us. We leave those for the temptation, but leave us for evil. The fire the kingdom, the fire the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Hello Norman, it's lovely to see you. Uh, you've picked a song for Songs of Praise. Would you tell us what it is and why you've chosen it? Yeah, it's Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. And uh, actually that takes me back a good number of years. I think the first time I heard that song, was in Harringay when Billy Graham was there. Wow. And uh, it's something that's been a, a constant blessing to me. And I, it really covers the whole Christian life. It does indeed, doesn't it? It does. Thanks ever so much, Norman. Really appreciate it. Thank you. 
reading is from John 19, 1 to 16. When Pilate had Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip, the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put a purple robe on him. Hail, King of the Jews, they mocked as they slapped him across the face. Pilate went outside again and said to the people, I am going to bring him out to you now, but understand clearly that I find him not guilty. Then Jesus came out wearing a crown of thorns and a purple robe. And Pilate said, look, here is the man. When they saw him, the leading priest and temple guard, guards become to shouting, crucify him, crucify him. Take him yourself and crucify him, Pilate said. I find him not guilty. The Jewish leaders replied, By our law he ought to die because he called himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was more frightened than ever. He took Jesus back into the headquarters again and asked him, Where are you from? But Jesus gave no answer. Why don't you talk to me? Pilate demanded. Don't you realise that I have the power to release you or crucify you? Then Jesus said, You would have no power over me at all unless you were given, given to you from above. So the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. Then Pilate tried to release him, but the Jewish leader shouted, If you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who declares himself a king is a rebel against Caesar. When they said this, Pilate brought Jesus out to them again. Then Pilate sat down on the judgment seat on the platform that is called the stone pavement in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was now about noon on the day of preparation for the Passover. And Pilate said to the people, Look, here is your king. Away with him, they yelled. Away with him, crucify him. What? Crucify your king, Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the leading priest shouted back. Then Pilate turned Jesus over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus away. Thanks, Val. There are several interesting things to consider in this passage. And I want to ask you a couple of questions right from the beginning. Who is on trial? What is Pilate meaning when he says, here is the man? Where are you in the picture? And I want to ask you just to remember what John said in chapter one when speaking of Jesus. Here comes the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. Let's start at the beginning. Now, there is so much to talk about in this passage that I don't really know where to begin. But I want to start by reminding you where we are on the timeline. And I want to just remind you of the most significant thing of today's passage. All these events have happened on the preparation day for the Passover. Do you remember that the Pharisees couldn't enter Pilate's Paris, palace because it would make them unclean and they wouldn't have been able to share in the Passover. What happens at the Passover? The perfect lamb is killed for the sins of the nation. Now I jump ahead, let's start at the beginning. There are two ways of looking at the suffering of Jesus. Looking at him from that side of the resurrection, what do you see? Do you see a pathetic, emaciated, haggard loser? And I think the truth of the matter is we don't because we cannot look on with pre-resurrection eyes. We just physically cannot do that. But in Luke 23, we read of grief-stricken women who trailed behind the entourage as the drama unfolds. Women and many others who had concluded that Jesus was indeed a loser. He was depleted of all resources. He was out without help. He had nothing going in his favour. And you can imagine their distress as they watched their friends suffer. It would appear that his mission had failed. It also appears 
that he passively and quietly resigns himself to Pontius Pilate. Remember, Pilate has the backing of the whole Roman Empire. Those people in that place perhaps don't really realise what exactly is going on. And if we were there, I'm not sure we would either. So what is going on? What does scripture reveal to us about Jesus? None of which was available at the time of the crucifixion, but it reveals to us that there was something else going on. This isn't simply a Roman trial involving a man. This is a cosmic, global trial involving the Son of God. Far from being a powerless defendant, Jesus is in fact the true judge of the world, and we will see him see, we will see him see through Pilate, see through the religious leaders, and then Jesus judges himself, and there are, of course, implications in that for us today. Okay, back to the passage. Pilate was clearly getting more and more frustrated. He knew that Jesus was innocent. He seemed to want to uphold, uphold justice. He also needed to keep the peace to maintain his authority. He's not afraid of the Jews. He had more than enough power at his disposal for to put down any uprising. Pilate feared the Roman authority that was over him. He feared Caesar. His job was to keep the peace and too much trouble in his region would cost him dearly. Pilate is a man caught between a rock and a hard place, we might say. And I think it's important to note that Jews usually despised Caesar as well and would have as little to do with him as possible. And we will return to that later. OK, so what about Pilate? On at least three occasions, Pilate declares Jesus innocent. He says, I find no basis for any charge against him. He says, I find this man innocent. And he says he is not guilty. Now, we know that Pilate is not neutral or objective because we read at the beginning of today's passage that he had Jesus flogged, scourged and whipped with a belt. His soldiers mocked him. They put on him this purple robe, a sign of wealth and kingship. The mock crown of thorns. They shout, hail, king of the Jews. Then he takes them out to the Jews and says, here is the man. Is Pilate mocking the Jews, trying to get them to see sense and change their minds? Here is the man. Here is your man. Does it mean more than I'm handing him back to you? This is your problem, not mine. I've gone as far as I can with this. But many scholars think God is highlighting something here that would not be missed by the Jews. Let me read Zechariah 6 verse 12 to you. This is what the Lord of Heaven's army says. Here is the man called the branch. He will branch out from where he is and build the temple of the Lord. Yes, he will build the temple of the Lord. Then he will receive royal honour and will rule as king from his throne. He will also serve as priest from his throne and there will be perfect harmony between his two roles. We might think that's pushing it a bit far. Would God use such a man to highlight that this is the Messiah, even if it were unwittingly. Well, of course he could. And many commentators have drawn attention to this fact. The passage in Zechariah was such an obvious messianic prophecy that the Targum, which was an ancient paraphrase of the Hebrew Bible from the first century for Aramaic speakers declared, behold the Lord means this is the Messiah. Jesus came to reveal God to the world. This is the perfect man, the perfect representation of God's image, not the fallen population, but the full image, the real thing. This man is not going to take the persona of a superhero, sweeping through the rebel state with horses and chariots, overcoming rebellion and evil in a blaze of glory. The man is crowned with thorns. He is the innocent king, the one who told the truth and now stands accused of blasphemy. Jesus, the eternal word, took our flesh. Look at this man and you see our living, loving, bruised, bleeding God. 
do you believe that Jesus is the man who took away your sin and disgrace and has brought you eternal life? Behold, says God, this is the man. Do you believe in him? So what of Pilate? He is the governor, he is in charge, his word is law, he can kill people if he wants to, he can let them go if he wants to. He could order the death of the chief priests themselves if he wanted to. He decides that he really does want to let Jesus go. And I'm sure there is little doubt in his mind that he will be successful in that. There is one problem. What the people think of him. Roman governors had over the years been killed on a regular basis for maladministration. All it took was for the people in the province to report the governor to Rome and then anything could happen. Many had been killed. Now let's look at the conversation. Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? And the, the priests answer, we have no king but Caesar. They didn't believe that Jesus was their king. But the Bible says, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, just a history lesson for those of you who don't know this, but the Jews hated the Romans and they despised Caesar. Rome controlled and dominated Israel and the people longed to be an independent nation where they could be in charge of their own lives. They were not a free people and they hated that. And yet, when asked if they would crucify their king, Jesus, they basically said, we'd rather be enslaved than accept Jesus. The Jews have really backed themselves into a corner now. They have sworn allegiance to a pagan nation, turned their back on God's authority. Now, I think we all sometimes get stuck between a rock and a hard place. But the question is, where do we put our loyalty? with Pilate as he is forced into an uncomfortable compromise? Or would we try to press home a political advantage like the priests? Or would we stand with Jesus, silent in the middle, continuing to reflect the love of God into a muddled and tragic world? Pontius Pilate stands before the masses and declares, behold the man. Behold your king. And then he asks, would you have me crucify your king? Now, I don't think Pilate really thought that Jesus was a king. I think that Pilate was just annoyed by the Jewish leaders and he wanted to get their goat. And so he says, behold your king. And the Jews take their bait. They cry out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. You want to crucify this man? then know that you have crucified your king. And that was perhaps that message that God wanted people to remember. You crucified your king. So he delivered him over to be crucified. Isn't it ironic? We have no heart king but Caesar, the priest said. And here Jesus is standing before them, the man the saviour, the messiah, promised from long ago. He is indeed their king, the son of David, the son of God. And so my question to you, will you have Jesus as your king? If your answer is yes, we must receive him. We must receive him, first of all, as the humble, lowly, self-sacrificing king that he is. But we must remember what might and power he held and what he overcame. We must look beyond the humble appearance to see the power which lies beneath. There is great power in his death. It is through death that Jesus earned victory for himself and for all who belong to him. The world looks at Jesus in his humility and scoffs. But those with faith, those born from above, look on Jesus and see the true power and glory that is there. 
we must come to terms with our need. Why do we need a king? Two reasons come to me. First, we need a king to forgive our sins. And secondly, we need a king to conquer all our enemies. And I don't mean physical enemies, I mean spiritual. When you think of the suffering Jesus, what is your image? When you think of Jesus on trial, what is your perspective? Is Jesus the emaciated, powerless defendant who passively and quietly resigns his fate to Pilate? Or is he the true king of all kings about to change everything? Pilate sees the truth behind the Jews, Jewish leaders. Jesus, sorry, sees the truth behind the Jewish leaders and takes our wrongdoings upon himself. The highest act of all time, the place of judgment that you and I deserve. Something else here that I think is significant. Remember I said at the beginning that John the Baptist said, here comes the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. Remember I said that we were on the day of preparation for the Passover, where the perfect lamb would be sacrificed for the sins of the nation. Jesus is about to be crucified on the day of the Passover as the perfect lamb who will take away the sins of the world once and for all. We join with John. Here is the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And how do you see yourself? There is a wonderful invitation that comes through in this passage, an invitation to admit we sin, not just that we sin, but that we fall short of our own standards, let alone God's. And I want you to remember that he came to take them from you. He came to remove the guilt, to remove everything that hinders, that he might take them to the cross and carry them away. How do we see ourselves today? You accept scripture and accept what Jesus did. You should see yourselves as forgiven. You should see yourself as one loved by God with a love too great even to imagine. As one who is precious in the sight of God and warmly embraced by him and welcomed into his presence. Jesus loves you with all his heart. He went to the cross for you. Where am I in the picture? I am at the foot of the cross. It was for me he died. I am forgiven. I am free. He loves me. I hope you know that too. Lovely to see you Val. You've picked a song for Songs of Praise for Sunday. I wonder if you tell us what it is and why. How do you choose a hymn? There are so many you love, but at the moment, the one closest to my heart is I Cast My Mind to Calvary, which Sheila introduced to us in the choir. And it spoke to me, really deep words, meant so much to me, and that's why I've picked it. Mm. And you particularly like the chorus, don't you? Oh, I do. I love the chorus. And when we sing it in church, I walk home and it I sing it to myself, the mm. chorus going home. Mm. And that's mm. how much it means to me. Fantastic. Thanks ever so much, Ryan. Take care. God bless. Thank you.
Thank you for being with us this morning. If you want to contact me about anything, my email is on the screen. There will be prayer meetings Monday, Wednesday and Friday at 9.30 to pray for the ever-changing situation and those on your heart and mind. Fellowship on Wednesday at 7.30 and Sunday at 6 p.m. And the Bible study on Thursday at 7.30 and we are halfway through Hebrews chapter 9. May the Lord of creation remake you. The ruler of history direct your path. The God of grace forgive you. May God be a rock to support you, a shield to protect you, a fortress to surround you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.